morning, everybody. I'm Alberto Pera, the chairman of the Italian Antitrust Association. And I want to thank Paolo for inviting the association to organize the opening session of the conference. Paolo is, is, is a friend since he used, we were used to work together at the Italian Antitrust Authority. He has gone a long way. Uh, he is an, an leader, he and is a, one of the founders of the CS Association, and Lear is a prominent member. The association gathers more than 50 law firms and economic consultancies operating in the field of antitrust and consumer protection. And I take his invitation also as a recognition of which I'm grateful about the role of the association in the discussions about competition law issues in this country. Now, given the, can the character of the conference of the organizer, we thought the discussion on the current status of the more economic approach would be an interesting subject. Now, I think some of you will say, Alberto, do you really think that the <clears throat> another discussion on the more economic approach would be really an interesting topic? Well, I think that despite this, this topic has been discussed at length, the subject is very actual and has very many interesting facets, which I think our session will show. The more, the more economic approach re <coughs> requires the contacts must be examined on the basis of their effects and therefore implies the generalized recourse to the rule of reason. Now, this is a big change. This is, is a big change in, uh, has meant a big change in the approach in uh, the European competition law in the last 30 years. It started in the, 90, in the 1990s on the initiative of the Commission uh, with the uh, enactment of the, of the first vertical block exemption regulation in the 1990, uh, which implied a substantial change from a previous formalistic approach. As for Article 101, it has been codified in the legal exception criteria of Article of Regulation 1, 2003 and has been gradually extended to the examination of Article 102 conduct. So it is something which, since many of you, most of you are very young, which has accompanied the changes in EU competition law. Over, over time, it has been endorsed by the courts in Article 101 with Carbon Care and in Article 102 with a number of decisions lately, Servizio Economico Nazionale. From a lawyer's point of view, it has created a more or less consistent framework for the identification of harm to competition, start on proof and distribution of the burden of proof. In this way, the more economic approach sets limits to the discretion of the investigating body and has providing guarantees in the investigation process, as recent decisions in uh, Intel and Qualcomm, uh, the recent sentences of the court, in Intel and Qualcomm, uh, have shown. So what's the problem with the more economic approach? Why should we talk about it? Well, there are a few important questions in the relation to the application of the approach. What are the relevant effects to be identified? The effects on the competitive process, the effects on consumer welfare, the effects on efficiency. How are efficiency and consumer welfare related? And as uh, recent papers often can post, how do you measure consumer welfare? Do you, welfare? do you measure it on the effects on prices or do you measure it on the effects on quantities? More fun fundamentally, despite the favor that the more economic approach is being gaining with the courts, the perception seems to emerge that, especially some competition authorities, even the commission, uh, think that the, the more economic approach does not allow to tackle conducts in markets prone to monopoly powers, particularly like the ones <coughs> on digital platforms. This has led to revival of approaches based on per se presumptions. Examples are the presumption at the basis of the <coughs> DMA and the reconsideration of vertical integration efficiency, both in mergers and in cases of dominant position. We had an example in the Amazon Italian case in front of the Italian antitrust authority. Finally, even more disruptive are the criticism and suggestion for the discussion originating in the US about the objectives of antitrust, from fairness to sustainability to income distribution to the role of economic power compared to market power. 
which would seem to call to a backward jump to where antitrust analysis was before the Sylvania decision. So a lot of things, in fact, despite all the discussion until now, and I think uh, that we have a wonderful panel to discuss these issues. Uh, first of all, let me introduce, well, if, if she needs to be introduced, Priya Rachma, who is professor of law at the University of Leeds, which has been, uh, during the last years, a very prominent discussant in uh, the discussion about competition, law, and policy. She has written a fascinating book on the concept of, and, uh, of abuse of dominance, and I think she is extremely apt to discuss the issues. Then I have Antonio Butta. Antonio Butta has been a prominent competition, economy, competition and regulation economist in the last 20 years. He has a PhD from the London School of Economics. She has been in consultancy, she has worked as an economist at Ofcom, and now she, has, she in the last few years, he has been the chief economist of the Italian Antitrust Authority. Giorgio Monti is, uh, uh, needs no presentation. He has been the uh, professor at the European University Institute, where he holds the course of uh, European competition law. And he is also professor at the University of Tilburg. He, is, he has written extensively in the last 20 years on issues of competition law. Alberto Toffoletto is a professor <coughs> of commercial law at the University of Milan. He is also the letter T in the NCTM uh, uh, law firm, one of the most important uh, law firm, corporate law firm uh, in Italy. Uh, he is extremely well known as an M&A and corporate lawyer, but he has a very long experience in the field of antitrust, having worked also at, uh, at the time of the enactment of the first Italian competition law and have been interested in issues of dominance since then. So I think uh, <clears throat> this is a very good panel. Uh, I, we have about an hour to debate to, to, to the section. I'll uh, ask the, the panelists to uh, talk about 10, 12 minutes uh, uh, each, and then uh, we, if there's time, there will be some intervention, otherwise we'll have some discussion among them. Uh, so I ask Pina to start. Good morning, and thank you very much for the invitation and the very kind introduction. So in my remarks, I'm going to try and adopt a positive approach um, to the more economic approach rather than a normative approach. And my main objective is try to establish where we currently are and by we, we mean the practice of EU competition law in terms of the more economic approach, because the title of this panel is, is the more economic approach in good health. So I'm trying to set out where I think the more economic approach is currently. So as has been mentioned, the European Commission started a journey of modernizing EU competition law by, amongst others, adopting a more economic approach. This started in the 90s, and the whole purpose of this modernization and the move to a more economic approach was to move away from a form-based approach. And that was because the form-based approach was, in my opinion, rightly criticized for finding contact anti-competitive, not on the effects of the practice, but on the form or the shape or the type of the practice in question. And that reform started with agreements, including vertical restraints, then merger control, then abuse of dominance, and policy instruments and documents such as the Article 1013 guidelines, the guidance on Article 102, the verticals block exemption regulation, and the accompanying guidelines are really all in the spirit of this more economic approach. Now, the first point I'd like to make, perhaps in order to clarify or steer the discussion a little bit is that there isn't actually a single definition of the more economic approach. And I think we could spend the next hour discussing what we actually mean by the more economic approach. But in order to avoid that, I'm going to just explain what I mean by the more economic approach for my purposes. And by that I mean the general trend involved which adopted, a, an, which adopted economic analysis to assess the actual or potential effects of a given practice rather than simply find anti-competitiveness based on the form or type of conduct. So in general terms, I guess I mean the opposite of a form-based approach which adopts economic analysis to examine the effects of a practice, potential or actual effects, before deciding whether that conduct is anti-competitive 
or not. Now, a second point I think related to this um, point I just made is that related to this move towards a more economic approach, in the EU we saw also at least an apparent move towards adopting a consumer welfare standard in terms of the objective of the enforcement of um, EU competition law. So at least in Europe, this change in approach, in adopting a more economic approach, was somehow intertwined with also at least an apparent change in objectives or perhaps priorities of enforcement, at least in the European Commission's practice. And in fact, if we look at the literature on the more economic approach, we see that almost all of the literature um, treat the consumer welfare objective and the more economic approach as if they're in a causal relationship. So if you adopt a more economic approach, then you must be pursuing a consumer welfare standard, or if the standard you're pursuing is a consumer welfare standard, then you must have adopted a more economic approach. In my opinion, it's debatable that these two concepts are necessarily connected in such a causal relationship. So it's possible that because economics and thus an economic approach requires more precision and certainty that vague or immeasurable objectives um, do not fit within a more economic approach. And as an example there, I can give fairness as an objective that could be pursued. But it's also possible, I think, at least in the European context, if we look at history and the timeline in which the more economic approach was adopted, we see that the Commission might have aimed to move towards adopting an approach such as the consumer welfare standard, because this modernization was taking place at the same time that the enforcement of EU competition law was being decentralized. So, if you had a decentralized enforcement method, I think that might have been also a strong reason to move away from an objective such as fairness towards an objective like the consumer welfare standard, which is at least somehow more measurable, uh, therefore which could at least provide some more uniformity in the application of the law amongst the member states. And I think in any case, um, no matter what the motivation might have been, and whether the consumer welfare standard is intricately linked to the more economic approach or not. Um, I don't think we could say that in all areas of its enforcement practice that the European Commission at any point adopted an approach that focused singularly on consumer harm. And on that note of enforcement, I'd like to make another point, um, which is that institutions matter quite a lot in terms of being able to identify what the approach is. And the reason I say that is because, especially in recent years, I think we see a distinct change in the rhetoric that's coming out of the Commission. In my opinion, the Commission's rhetoric, or at least apparent approach, changed quite considerably with the um, constant repetitive references to fairness as the guiding star, or at least an important guiding star, of antitrust enforcement. And I think that is, as an objective, as I mentioned earlier, quite difficult to reconcile with a more, more, more economic approach. So if you compare the speeches by Commissioner Vestager with the speeches of Commissioners Almunia or Cruz, I think the difference is quite stark. And that probably has some implications as to trying to establish what the current approach of the EC, the European Commission, is um, to EU competition law. There's also another layer of complexity regarding um, the approach of the European Commission. And I think that's because irrespective of the change in policy and or the enforcement priorities of the European Commission, and irrespective of the particular focus given commissioners put on the more economic approach, I think we also need to distinguish the practice of DG Comp, the Director General for Competition, from the practice of the legal service at the Commission. And one of the most notable um, examples of that distinction to me is the Intel case. Um, so I have in mind the original Commission decision from 2009 and the appeal, the first appeal of the Intel decision. 
You might remember that the original Intel decision was adopted only a few months after the Commission adopted its Article 102 guidance paper. And the Commission had said um, in Intel that, you know, the guidance was strictly speaking not applicable to Intel because of the timing of the events that led to the Intel decision and the adoption of the guidance. But nevertheless, according to the Commission, the decision was in line with the orientations of the guidance paper. Now, it was very interesting to see then what the Commission argued in defending itself in the appeal of Intel in 2014. Remember, this case has to do with exclusivity rebates, fidelity rebates, and the Commission, now speaking in the legal service, essentially, the legal service argued that for fidelity rebates, and I quote, it's not necessary to establish actual or potential foreclosure effects on a case-by-case -case basis. So according to legal service, in fidelity rebates, it's not necessary to establish even the capability to foreclose of a practice, of the practice in question. And further, I quote again, the commission disputes that the as efficient competitor test forms part of the legal analysis of the decision. Now, this couldn't have stood in starker contrast to what the Commission had done in the guidance, because one of the main tenets of the guidance was, of course, to set out as efficient competitor test as the guiding principle for price-based conduct and stipulate that foreclosure is only anti-competitive where it has an adverse impact on consumer welfare. So separating out you know, the institutions, the key players in this debate takes me to what is, I think, my fourth point, which is that as things currently stand, if the more economic approach is to survive, then the institution, perhaps the only institution that can facilitate that is the Court of Justice of the European Union. And in fact, recent case law from the court suggests that the Court of Justice may just be finishing off the job that DGCOM started. And I'm going to elaborate on what I mean by that in the um, remainder of the time I have. So in a series of case law on Article 101 and 102, we see that, at least I think, that there's a distinct change in the court's approach, which does look like it's more willing to adopt a more economic approach, and which certainly is moving away from a form-based approach. In the context of Article 101, I think that's the most obvious, as was already mentioned, in the line of cases starting with Alliance Hungaria and Carte Bancaire, um, where we see that the court has re restricted even the scope of by-object violations, um, which in short has been done by saying um, the reason these are by-object restrictions is because experience show that they actually result in 99% of the time in harmful economic outcomes for consumers, be it in higher prices, lower output, lower choice, and so on. So the way I read the 101 case law is that even for by-object restrictions, the rationale underlying those restrictions is actually an economic approach. But I think this move is even more visible in the case of Article 102, and I'm going to focus on Article 102 um, in the rest of my time, which I think is only two minutes. Um, the reason I want to focus on the approach to Article 102 is because that approach was perhaps the most formalistic of all in EU competition law enforcement. <laughs> but if we look at the timeline of cases, um, starting perhaps with post-Denmark 1, um, there have been some exceptions in that timeline, like post-Denmark 2 perhaps, but starting with post-Denmark 1, then Generics, Intel, Qualcomm, and most recently NL, I think we see that the court is now embracing the as efficient competitor standard. And I say standard because I think standard has to be distinguished from the as efficient competitor test, which is different, but I don't have time to go into that at the moment. But I think it's an important distinction. And the court is adopting the as efficient competitor standard, not necessarily the test. And the court also rejects an approach that protects competitors for the sake of protecting competitors. Numerous times the court has now said that competition on the merits, by definition, may lead to the departure of less efficient undertakings um, from the market and also less attractive undertakings um, because they don't offer the same price, choice, quality, or innovation that more efficient undertakings may offer to consumers. 
Then, of course, we have Intel, where in a rather cryptic manner, the Court of Justice clarified some of its earlier but most form-based precedent, which is the Hoffman-LaRoche line of case law, and held that to be abusive, conduct must be, I quote, capable of foreclosing competition and also capable of producing the alleged foreclosure effects. To me, that simply says that from now on, at least, or maybe it was always the case because the court only clarified its case law, conduct cannot be abusive based on its form alone. Now, because of the way in which Intel was worded, quite a few questions were left open. So first of all, was this simply a procedural glitch? Uh, was this only a procedural right for the undertaking to put this forward as a defense? Or is this now the actual test or standard for abuse? And also another question was, was this only limited to price-based abuses? I think those questions were answered in generics, where the court clearly moves away from a form-based approach by finding, in general terms, that if conduct is to be characterized as abusive, that presupposes that that conduct is capable of restricting competition, and in particular, capable of producing the alleged exclusionary effects. And that assessment has to be undertaken having regard to all the relevant facts surrounding that conduct. So it's certainly not a form-based approach. And the way this was expressed in generics is not limited to price-based conduct either. Yeah. So I know I'm running out of time and I'll finish. And of course, then we had the general court's second ruling in Intel, which simply confirmed um, what I've tried to explain. And of course, we then have Qualcomm, where the court quite substantially engages with the economic analysis carried out by the European Commission and finds that it wasn't good enough and that decision was therefore annulled. Lastly, we have NL, where again, I think the court explains in general terms that it is the efficient competitor standard that now applies to price-based and non-price-based conduct under Article 102. So my last point is therefore to ask whether we now have a full economic approach under EU competition law, and the answer to that is of course no. Um, and that's because this case law I've just tried to um, describe is also full of references to the case law that adopted a more traditional approach. So the traditional approach is still firmly in the case law. Concepts like competition on the merits, special responsibility, and references to concepts such as the detriment to public interest in expressing the objective of EU competition law, they're still there. So I think um, some of these, what I call legacy rules and concepts are still there and they don't really fit with a more economic approach. And therefore, all in all, I think what seems to have happened and where we are now is that the court has definitely become more economic in its approach and the court certainly demands more of the commission in terms of the economic analysis, um, but currently it's hard to tell how far this turn of the tide will go, and I think we have a hybrid approach as is so popular at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pina. You have not been on the time, but that was fine because you said very, very interesting things uh, on, on many grounds, so thank you. Uh, I, I would have a lot of comments to make, but I won't because there's no time. And so I leave the floor instead to Antonio, uh, who may tell us uh, about also competition authorities' experience. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Alberto. It's great to be part of this festival and a pleasure to be part of this festival in person with you all. So, Alberto asked me, keep it simple, and uh, I will, but I could not resist but to take an empirical approach today. Actually, three pieces of empirical evidence that I would like to present to you. So the first one is by using the available data today, one could be inclined to estimate the role that economists have played in shaping the fortunes, the course 
of the more economic approach to be in the range between 25% and 40%. And the estimation is clearly based on the headcount of economists uh, around this table, and the range depends on how you treat our chair, Alberto, so whether you treat him as um, one of the other panelists or not. So clearly, I mean, this estimation wouldn't stand in court. <laughs> I know. Uh, but actually, perhaps the figure does not look too far away from reality. After all, economists are one, perhaps even tiny component of the complex institutional systems that shape antitrust enforcement, both within competition authorities and outside, of course, when we think about the courts and, and what they uh, have been doing. So uh, I'm well aware of the limitations of these estimations. So let me turn to the second piece of empirical evidence by referring to the work of some more serious economists that have actually tried to empirically estimate the extent to which um, uh, actually economic analysis in antitrust case have evolved over the course of the years. And I'm referring to some work which has been published last year by Yanis Katsulakos and co-authors, and uh, they've really tried to actually construct and measure indicators capturing the extent and the type of economic analysis adopted by decisions taken by DG competition and some national competition authorities between 1992 and 2016. And um, so they have reached three conclusions and I would like to share and discuss them with you. So the first conclusion is about how, what, what role has economic analysis played? So over this admittedly long time horizon, I mean, their conclusion is that the role of economics is modest, actually. But the real um, uh, evidence that they put forward, I think, is that they identify a very consistent and significant improvement over time, especially in the quality of enforcement in abuse cases. According to them, the situation is relatively different from vertical uh, agreements. And even more strikingly, perhaps, if you want, I mean, they um, suggest that digi-competition, at least, has actually converged towards a full effects-based analysis with a consumer surplus substantive standard um, adopted. Uh, and so they suggest, in more generally, that digi-competition has indeed been influenced uh, uh, significantly by progress of economic analysis in reality in recent decades. I mean, now if I just compare it very unscientifically to my own personal experience, I think that clearly, I mean, this study captures a very well um, clear trend in what has been uh, the growth of the role of economic analysis in antitrust enforcement. So, I mean, now, I mean, I can compare what we see today, even in Italy, to what um, I, I was experiencing uh, like 15 years ago as a consultant, and the market for economic consultants is, has grown significantly significantly in any abuse, I would say there are economic consultants involved and a lot of discussion is based upon uh, economics, theories, economic evidence. Um, so now whether this has really led to a full effects-based decisions, I mean, this is probably too uh, much of a, too, too much, too, too a strong, too much of a strong uh, decisions. I think that even today we do have uh, if you want uh, uh, some dispersion, some variance across the type of, um, uh, of the role of economic analysis in a number of cases. And I think that's normal in to the extent to which uh, different cases actually ask for different economic analysis. And it's not an issue of being black and white. As the authors of this study recognize, it is really more of an issue of a continuum. So we can have a full effects base, we can have a truncated uh, effects analysis and everything in between. And uh, um, this result is even more, uh, if you want, clear uh, we, if we think of, uh, about the variance at the geographic level or between jurisdiction. If indeed, the second empirical result they um, obtain is that there are significant differences among different jurisdictions and especially significant differences between digi competition and national competition authorities. To be clear, they just focus on France and Greece as well as other national competition authorities not within the EU. But I think, uh, I mean, it is fair to say, I mean, in, in, you know, we discuss a lot and very often what is going on uh, at the DigiComp level. Uh, if we also look at what's going on at the national level, I think if you want, uh, uh, it, it, it is hard to 
say that the more economic approach has led to really a convergent standard that applies across the board and is uh, embraced by all competition authorities at the national. Uh, at the national level. So there are a lot of differences, and sometimes they're very interesting. A few years ago, I mean, uh, several competition authorities did cases in the postal sector, very similar cases, Italy, Spain, Germany, France, uh, not France, the UK. And interestingly, I mean, we have the whole range of analysis being adopted, formalistic approach, economic approach, and within the economic approach, different models being used and different ways of doing an effects-based analysis. So still, I think we do not have, as of today, a common and shared understanding of what the analysis is or should be, and even when you undertake an economic analysis, how it should be done. And the third empirical result of these authors relate to the courts. And here they suggest that actually having more economic analysis in the cases has not an impact on the annulment decision um, of, the, uh, of abuse of dominance uh, cases. So I think perhaps, I mean, it, 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 this uh, study um, uh, looked only up to 2016. I mean, and if we look at more recent cases in the last few years, this uh, conclusion might have been reversed. Of course, I mean, uh, Pinar has already mentioned what has happened with cases as important as Intel and Qualcomm. And, um, and clearly, there, these are cases. And if we want to go outside the abuse of dominance world, even about mergers, Telefonica or UPSTT. These are all cases where annulment decisions were based on uh, shortcomings of the economic analysis and even procedural shortcomings related to the economic analysis, which are pretty, if you want, even procedurally, I mean, when you do economic analysis in cases, it has a lot of weight on, on, on how actually the case and how it evolves. So I think, I mean, I think that actually at present I would not say that um, the more economic analysis has no impact on the court. And, and I don't even think that this is simply because the Commission is trying to pursue a formalistic approach. I mean, here the issue is really about the very details of the economic analysis, especially when we enter into the realm of quantitative tests, where my reading of the court decisions is that there is really uh, some uh, misalignment with, if you want, what is done, what can be done, and what perhaps the courts expect that can be done through quantitative analysis. Clearly, quantitative analysis is not, necessary, uh, is not necessary in a more economic approach. And when it is undertaken, however, I think um, there are clearly in some inherent limitations in economic analysis, and I'm not clear whether what can be done with the quantitative economic analysis is fully understood by the courts, or if ever we can have economic analysis that will reach the reliability that the court expects evidence should have. So let me complete and let me finish with the third piece of empirical evidence. Again, I go back to, my <laughs> to one afternoon of, of, of last week when I actually tried to, to read um, uh, the, 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 the last decisions, so to complete the sample that uh, was used by these authors, um, by the court. So Intel, Qualcomm, Google Android, and Google Shopping to see whether what also Pinar is identifying as being a trend appears in, in what we read in these decisions. Being a, an economist, I need a counterfactual. So I went back to 2007 to the Microsoft media player. So if I read that decision, that decision is based essentially on three things, foreclosure, competition on the merits, and competitive process. Okay, so these are the keywords I identify, I've identified in that decision. Now if we read the more recent decision by the courts, uh, Intel and Qualcomm, uh, yes, they are about foreclosure. I mean, competition on the merits is rarely mentioned in these decisions as opposed to efficiency, as opposed to an as efficient competitor or less efficient competitors. So uh, this goes, uh, if you want, towards the direction Pinar was suggesting. It seems that we are embracing um, a kind of uh, a stand, a legal standard related to an as efficient competitor. In Google Android, which is more recent, we are, I think, in, in, in a mixed world. Uh, we have a lot of references to competition on the merits, a lot of reference uh, to efficiency and foreclosure. Even though all these references to efficiencies are more mostly related to the um, revenue sharing agreements where the commission undertook a, an as efficient competitor test. Now then look at another decision, Google Shopping. Google Shopping, 
is about competition on the merits. Efficiency is rarely, barely mentioned, and even foreclosure is barely mentioned. And interestingly, this is perhaps one of the only decisions of the courts where I do find some uh, um, uh, few references to harm or detriment to consumers. So, I mean, this is to say that if you want, I think I agree with Pinard that we are in a hybrid world, we are in a mixed world, you know, case law is evolving. I don't think that we are in a mixed world today because of past dependency or that it's to a certain extent, I think that we'll remain in a mixed world where uh, we, we will not have one single, if you want, paradigm, which is the as efficient competitor uh, standard, which I don't think should be embraced across the board, by the way. Uh, and um, uh, then let me just finish with something looking uh, at the future. So we are thinking always backwards, and we are thinking, okay, have we reached what we were meant to reach? I mean, when we devised or we this more economic approach? Um, I think today we should ask another question, which is how can we change the way we do economic analysis in competition? And I'm, I'm saying that because I have the perception, and also if I look at what is happening in public policy with the development of regulation, which is completely devoid of economic analysis as the DMA, uh, as competition economists, we should uh, also think that economics is not only about constraining uh, the analysis, it is and it should be, but it is also the tool, the best tool that we have to develop the analysis, to create, to develop new theories of harm, to adapt the theories of harm to different market environments. So if we lose this constructive role of economic analysis, then I think uh, we will never have a successful more economic approach. We will have a more formalistic economic approach and that's something that looking forward I would like to avoid very much. So thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, you, we need more economists in the, in the competition authorities then. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good, very interesting. Now I leave the floor to Giorgio. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alberto, and thank you for the organizers for allowing me to participate uh, in, in this festival. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to make three points. First, I want to go back to the question Pinar asked. What is um, an economic approach? Second, once we work that out, what is the proper integration of economics in a decision, which develops a bit of the points that uh, Antonio just made? And thirdly, some institutional implications of using an economic approach. So what is it? Can we, in the room, anybody identify, or can you imagine in your mind, what is a good decision which you think embodies the economic approach. Is there a decision which actually hits all the benchmarks? So if you peruse the Android decision, you find that in market definition, the commission used the small, substantial, non-transitory decreasing quality test. In dominance, it uses behavioral economics to say there's a status quo bias. And it develops an innovation theory of harm because it says the exclusionary practices deprive the consumers of innovation from new entrants. Is that the economic approach? Is the guidance paper an embodiment of the economic approach? Uh, Pina wrote a fantastic paper on the, economic, on the guidance paper when it came out, and she looked at it and she said it looks like an economic approach, but digging into it a little bit more, it has its own limitations. So it's kind of difficult to find any substantive piece of law, soft law, or decision where we find, oh, this is the economic approach. Likewise, what are its attributes? Is the as efficient competitor standard a necessary requirement in an economic approach? Is an effects analysis a necessary requirement? Is the presence of an efficiency defense? So we don't really know what it is we're talking about, and I think that doubt is, is interesting. But there are two subsidiary questions to that. Uh, when Mario Monti introduced the more economic approach as commissioner, he said we need to use mainstream economics. Okay, what's that? Take predatory pricing. Predatory pricing is rarely tried and rarely successful, says the Supreme Court. Is that mainstream economics? Or is mainstream e economics saying that there are certain structural features in a market where predation makes economic sense and we need to identify those structural features before determining whether or not uh, predation is likely, a more post-Chicago approach? So there are varieties of economics, and how would we adjudicate uh, which one is the one that is legitimate? And you find in some merger decisions in the Commission very lengthy annexes where the chief economist and his team go through a range of economic papers to identify what is the dominant economic thinking behind innovation theory of harm, for example. 
And the second thing is, what is a good economic approach? So let's take the guidance on enforcement priorities again. So there, there is the as efficient competitor test, which is applied to rebates. There are papers authored by two former chief economists, one co-authored by Damian Neven and another in the book by Fumagalli, Motta, and Calcagno, who say, well, the guidance paper has a nice attempt, but it's not good enough to apply an economics approach to rebates, and both of them go on to propose a different test. So even identifying what is a good economic approach seems to be difficult when economists among themselves uh, produce different variations of the same theme. But this is actually not such a bad thing. So let's go back to Antonio's point about the postal services case law being different in different jurisdictions. But that is a fantastic learning moment because you can then experiment ex post to work out, okay, which agency applied the superior test which led to the market being more open to competition. So to a certain extent, diversity is a richness uh, and the fact that Regulation 1 facilitates experimentation among national competition authorities should be welcomed. Okay, let me try and move more normative now to my second point. What is the... Um, proper integration of economics and law. And my sense is that economists should be at the front end of a case to explain what is the potential economic logic of the conduct that is being observed. What is, is it an exclusionary case? Is it exclusion in the market where the firm is dominant? Is it exclusion by leverage? And once we understand the possible competitive risks, as well as the possible efficiency motivations behind that particular conduct, then it's up to the lawyers to translate that economic insight into workable rules. So if you take the uh, Android decision again, uh, the test for tying is a five-stage test that I'm not going to repeat, but it's fairly form-based for a large part of it. Are there two products? Are they in different market? Are the products tied? Uh, refusal to deal is a purely form-based test, but that doesn't mean it's devoid of economics. You use the economics to identify a legal standard that can be properly applied. So economists at the front end, but lawyers then digging into the factual matrix to work out which facts matter to tell us whether or not the conduct is anti-competitive or efficient. And so that's kind of the, the, the symbiosis between the two. Um, another implication of, uh, or another way of integrating economics well is found in Intel where the court allows the defendant dominant company to rebut the case of the commission. So the commission in Intel ran an, an object-based approach, you know, these rebates are anti-competitive, but Intel can force the commission to a deeper analysis of the effects if it can ca cast doubt on the anti-competitive uh, nature of the conduct in question. And I think what Intel is really valuable for is in allowing a conversation to develop between the agency and the defendant, where the agency can say, this is my view of how things work, but the defendant can then bring up additional evidence to suggest, well, perhaps you need to think harder before you condemn me for abusing a dominant position, forcing the agency into a second stage. Uh, let me move on to, just for reasons of time, institutional design, and what are the implications of, of moving to an, an approach where courts use more uh, economics? I think there are two. First, let me talk a little bit about adjudication. So already in 2005, David Gerber was saying, with a more economic approach, courts become economic experts. And they need to work out what it is about economics that uh, uh, makes the decision function. And you've already mentioned, Antonio, the difficulty in, in quantitative analysis. And you see this in CK Telecoms, for example, where, of course, the evidence of uh, the, the quantitative evidence was vague and inconclusive because that's the very nature of the evidence. And the court hasn't yet worked this out. But more, more generally, also, if you look at Android, Android is a case where the general court looks very attentively at a lot of evidence, but it has no theory of relevance about what this evidence is. Here is a story by this rival who is complaining. Here is an email by a Google chief executive. Okay, these are all very interesting indicators, but we need a more broad, and here is where lawyers are needed, not economists, conceptualization of how do you decide which evidence is relevant and how much evidence do you need in order to move from doubt to conclusion. And I think here, while the general court does a tremendous effort, in the face of what must have been a gigantic case file in identifying the relevant pieces of evidence to analyze, it needs a more general understanding of how to think through uh, the quality uh, of evidence. And that's not just the economic evidence as quality, but also the factual evidence that is, is provided to it. And how much evidence do you need to support a claim? It's not clear that the general court has, ha, explains to us what its understanding is. <clears throat> 
It also raises questions about the standard of proof. Um, there seems to be a move by the general court in at least three judgments where they say uh, the court will overturn a commission decision if it can doubt what the commission has said. And this move is very different from what we had 15 years ago in Tetra Laval, where Tetra Laval said, so long as in applying economics, the commission took into account all the relevant factors, did not take into account any irrelevant factors, and analyzed all the evidence thoroughly, we'll say, okay, we might have some doubts, but it looks reasonable. Whereas now the commission appears, the court, the general court at any rate, appears to be a little bit more intrusive and say, no, if we are doubtful of the commission's correctness, then the Charter of Fundamental Rights teaches us that we must presume innocence. Query whether that is the right standard when you're judging economics. It's one thing when you're judging, has A killed B? Then yeah, maybe you want a standard where if I doubt the truth of the evidence, I don't convict. But in economics, is this legal standard really matching the kind of economic evidence that is presented? That's to consider. And the other thing uh, on, on the institution is if you read some of these decisions, which are basically like extensive novels, which are more boring than the most boring author you can imagine, right? Android is 100,000 words. Uh, Google Shopping is likewise the same length. Are we losing, in looking meticulously at the content of a particular email, the general theory of harm that the commission is running? So is the court in danger of just focusing on the minutia and overlooking the overall picture? Now in Android, the general court appears to be conscious of this criticism and always says, even though we look specifically at one piece of evidence, we must bear in mind the overall issue. But I wonder how, how how much uh, the, the court risks going, getting lost in the details. And the second remark, and I'll close on this, on institutional design, is the extent to which having the commission as a decision maker and the general court as a review court is really the most effective way of embodying an economic approach. Now, I'm not recommending this at all, okay? But should, wouldn't we not be in a better world where the competition authority runs the case as a prosecutor and we have one court which defines the truth of the facts? And there are two reasons why this, I think, could be useful. The first is that in between the decision and the appeal, you now have a lot more evidence that is introduced into the file. And to a certain extent, the authority has to defend the decision it took at that time. So in Intel, in 2019, it was defending a decision it had taken in 2008. And more evidence comes in, and how do you integrate it? And so it might be preferable to just have one moment where one decision maker identifies the truth rather than now having two versions of the truth. So if you take the CK Telecoms judgment, you have one version of uh, the truth about how the telecoms market work in the UK in the commission and an alternative version in the general court. Likewise, the fact that the defendant is entitled to rebut the claim of the agency under the Intel standard may make more sense in court because the court may then be able to say, has the agency made a good enough object case has the defendant brought me enough evidence to convince me that the commission should work harder and produce a more granular effects-based analysis? So perhaps the conversation that Intel creates between plaintiff and defendant, authority and dominant company, is better managed uh, in an adversarial setting rather than as a commission being the decision maker first and an appeal arriving several years down the line. Okay, thank you. Thank you, George. A very, <clears throat> very interesting and positive and a lot of issues that we won't be able to discuss, but I'll try them later to just to, to give a hint. Uh, one point I have, that in those formative years in which the economic approach started getting into the, 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 the European uh, competition practices, the idea of uh, a two steps uh, uh, judgment whereby you had an inquiring body, the commission, and the, at, the, at the time the Tribunal di Primo Grado, the general court as a, as a, as a judge was floated during those days in which there was a discussion about the defendant competition authority and so on. So uh, things always come back. So <laughs> at this point, let's, let's have Alberto. Uh, the last word, not really the last, because I hope we'll have two minutes to discuss among ourselves. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Alberto, and thank you uh, to Lear for the invitation. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here.
uh, how difficult is my position, because I, my friend Alberto brought me here, because I wrote many times that uh, the economic approach uh, uh, is risky and uh, can create problem in the interpretation of the law if not used carefully. Obviously, antitrust law is uh, a, a field of the law where uh, economic analysis is useful. Nobody can deny it. But the problem is, in my view, that we cannot rely just on economic analysis because the, 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 the rules are based on values that are not caught by the economic analysis. And even if I appreciate the fact that it is possible, as uh, Georgia was suggesting before, to have the economic analysis and have the lawyer then to translate it in a rule of law or in the application of the rule of law, the risk is that uh, this exercise cannot, is not done uh, properly because uh, the risk is that the economic test is applied mechanically. And this is what, in my view, we can see uh, after 30 years of these, uh, uh, of these uh, developments. First of all, I always want to underline the fact that the result of these 30 years probably is not brilliant as a matter of uh, com competition level in all the markets. In my view, in the last 30 years, we created a lot of situation of market power and uh, a lot of situation in which uh, we do not have a proper competition. So I think that one of the issues of discussion is uh, on one side the, the, the key elements of uh, the economic analysis and probably the discussion should be broke on a different uh, on a different field, what kind, of, what kind of competition do we want to have? And is the, the object of the protection just efficiency, the growth, or we have something else? Because if we do not carry on this discussion, probably we do not have any possibility to discuss. So my idea is that uh, Competition is not a race, because a race needs a winner. And if there is a winner, the, 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 uh, the market doesn't exist anymore. So I think that we cannot, we cannot just say to protect competition is wrong. To protect competition is equal to protect non-efficient firms. This is not true. To protect competition is the protection of a system. And this system should be put at the basis of our economic and political system. Because the pluralism of the presence on the market, the protection from the market power is the defense for the democracy as well. This is the basis of antitrust law, and it can never be changed. We know economic game is different. So in my view, what has been happening in the last years has been a, a focalization on the protection of the transactions in the perspective of the maximization of the of the global results. This has brought an attention, and Giorgio was making this point, in my view, uh, on the risk of the court uh, losing the, the overall picture and getting to the details. If you protect the transactions, all the legislation and all the interpretation is focused on the idea to increase the number of transactions because this increased the value, the global value of the system. But this is probably something which is not necessarily desirable, because the protection should be 
not to the transaction, but to the persons. So in my view, all these elements should be discussed before. And I do not deny, obviously, that the economic approach is useful. But I think that it should be used in the light of the objectives. And only this exercise produced desirable results. So what is the, the, the exercise that should be done by agencies and courts? In my view, the exercise is an exercise based on interpretation of the law, as any other law, because antitrust law is still a law. And as such, we have to start from the aim of the protection. So from the rule, from the principle of the law, from the rule, and from the aim of the protection. And this is the exercise that must be kept in mind. I have to underline the fact that in the last uh, few months, I would say, I have seen signs of this in the Italian Antitrust Authority and also in the courts. The Supreme Court, with the judgment on the nullity, partial nullity of the contracts derived from uh, a, 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 an illegal uh, cartel, show an attention to the protection and make easier to recover the money. This is a, a way to create protection. I do not share the idea that the per se prohibition is by definition formalistic. I think that this was something that has been repeated in, in the literature, but does not, uh, does not uh, correspond to the analysis that has been done in the, in the, in the, in the decades. In my view, the per se prohibition is not really a per se prohibition, but is a result of the analysis that has been done, taking into account a, a, a number of situations, a number of elements that brought to a certain result and the experience brought to the, to, the, to the idea that behind that situation there is something against the desired result. Now, are we sure that with Intel we have made something useful? I'm not sure, because in my view the risk of this, when we, when we are in a situation of dominance, can you imagine that a fidelity rebate create any value? To me, is, is almost impossible, because the risk of the foreclosure effect is by definition higher. And I'm not sure that there is the possibility to, to apply the, uh, the, 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 the test uh, or the standard that can give a different solution. Because the, the efficient competitor in presence of a dominant firm cannot be at the same level. And this brings, in my view, to just one result. And the result is that the, the, the dominant become always more powerful. And I don't think that this is the aim of our law, of our treaty, and the protection of the people that we want to achieve. I'm not sure if it is possible to give the certainty. I understand the, the argument of the certainty of the law and the certainty of the interpretation. Obviously, economic analysis bring to the table a solution, a mechanic solution, which is much easier to apply. While the, the, the discussion on the values, the discussion of the aim, the goals of the system are certainly more complicated. But I think that it is better with the system of case law that we have in Europe, uh, which is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, a, a, a slow uh, development of the law. I think that uh, it, is, it is a much higher level of protection 
uh, instead of having a, a, a ready solution uh, which, in my view, uh, is never uh, taking into account the values which are needed. And I want just to spend one word on the consumer welfare. It is not needed because obviously everybody knows that there are many challenges to the fact that the consumer welfare is able to, to uh, uh, include all the necessary elements. But certainly, in my view, it is uh, in some way uh, uh, not possible to consider that uh, the consumer welfare is countable in the sense that the economic approach would like to have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alberto, for completing this survey of positions about uh, the more economic approach. I think, personally, uh, um, uh, uh, I found a, a very, very interesting, particularly because it poses an issue which comes from the first words uh, Pinar was saying and uh, goes through the discussion. I, what is the objective of competition law? And at the end, what are we trying to achieve by, using the, by adopting the more economic approach? I personally feel that uh, the approach of the, 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 the objective of the law is the one that the court defined in Hoffman La Roche, a competition on the merits. And that what we use the economic approach for is to try to identify presumptions which tell us when competition of the merits is restricted and ways a standard of proof according to which we evaluate this. And, and we eventually uh, then define who has the burden of proof. And perhaps in certain cases we don't even have to define it because we have presumptions which are so clear that we have rule, uh, uh, per se rules. Uh, but this is something which I perhaps I may ask the panelists to spend one minute to discuss. Pina. Thank you. Um, I think the difficulty with that is if the objective is competition on the merits, then the question is what's competition on the merits? So we end up in this circle and then it becomes again normative because do we define competition what on the merits? What is competition? Let's put it this way. What's even competition? And there was a distinction made which was very interesting by Alberto. He said he doesn't think it's a race. So there are two perspectives of competition. It could be a race run whereby one wins the competition and then there's or the liberal concept of competition which is more like it's a race run in parallel. So mm -hmm. it's about facilitating the race but then a race will have a winner, and then what do you do? And then the Supreme Court in the US says, you know, the winner must not be turned upon when he wins. So is it okay if, let's say, a monopoly is achieved through the success of the firm, in which case does that mean we no longer have competition on the merits, or is it only a problem when that monopoly is achieved or sustained through ex exclusionary behavior? Uh, I mean, the question on objectives is a very difficult one, which was the question that took me to the archives for my PhD about 15 years ago where I read the negotiating, the travel preparatory of the treaties, and there one objective that was repeatedly mentioned is efficiency and Europe trying to become as efficient on the global arena as at the time USSR and the US was. So efficiency is of course what's going to drive competition amongst you know, companies as well as amongst nations. So I don't think we can simply ignore the efficiency objective, but of course Article 102 itself also refers to fairness on numerous occasions. So I don't think it's very straightforward. Thank you, Pinar. In fact, well, efficiency is the objective of the, of the, of the community at the time. Obviously, it depends on, on the level. But obviously, the issue you pose is, is the one which led the court to have concept like special responsibility, essential facility. You may be the only one, but then you have to abide to fair play and so on. I'm going to answer a different question. <laughs> I just to say, I don't know whether we, I mean, can we ever define what competition, what competition on the merits is? Why don't we just look at why a particular conduct is harming competition? So, and this goes back to what Giorgio Mont was saying about theories of harm. So, if I go back to these small empirical studies, just counting the, the words in the decisions of the court, a theory of harm 
appears just in one decision, the Qualcomm. In all other decisions, there's no reference whatsoever to the notion of theory of harm. So perhaps, why don't we just put more effort in, in trying to um, uh, develop theories of harm explicitly better in our cases rather than trying to define what competition is or should be. Thank you, Antonio. Giorgio? If you look at competition laws outside of the European Union, they have an objective. In China, the objective is to promote the socialist economy. So competition law means what the constitutional order says. And if you look at the EU merger regulation in the recitals, it says merger control shall be interpreted having regard to the aims of the European Union found in Article 3 TEU. So competition law is about the general welfare as identified in a particular historical moment by the competition authority doing its best to interpret the treaty in the best way possible. That's the answer. Well, this means that we should go back to order liberal and social market economy and, uh, and so on. Is that the question? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. It's better that... Uh, I, I agree. I agree. The, the, the rule should be interpreted with, within the principle of the law. There is no way, other way to do it. And uh, this is the exercise. And if we take the principle of the treaty and for, for Italy, of the Italian Constitution, is very clear that you cannot, for example, forget the, 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 the effect on the distribution of wealth. And so if you take this into account, everything, everything should be analyzed with the different glasses. Thank you, Alberto. Coming from a transactional lawyer, this is particularly interesting. Thank you very much for everybody, to everybody, to the panelists, for you who have uh, been patient enough. And now we are going to the uh, coffee break, which is offered by Badger Flight. Thank you. <laughs>